All right, testing for audio, testing, testing. How's the audio going, everyone? How is the audio? I'm gonna try it. Okay, trying again with the audio. Here All right, how's the audio now? How is the audio? Let me know how it's going. Hey, my friend, you're not gonna be doing that. You hear me now? Okay, good. I'm just configuring and then dropping my microphone. I'm not sure why the microphone wasn't working before, but <laughs> it is now, so that's what's important, right? Okay, cool. I've got snakes attempting to climb out of this box here. Sorry, buddy. Don't mean to scare you. These lovely, lovely melanistics. Oop. One just hightailed it right out of the... You probably don't want to see my hairy arm. There we go. Look at these beauties. Like I said, they're going to be brumating for the first time. We have lots of questions about brumation. So we're going to be talking about that. Um, so you're female, you're female eight, you're male. Oh, eight. That's, that's sad. What kind of garter do you have? These are so beautiful, aren't they? They just, every time, blows my mind. So they're putting on some size. They're not nearly as small as they were. They are breeding size. They're going to be smaller for breeding, but they're going down into brumation so that I can breed them uh, next spring. So we'll probably feature the garters a little bit later again. But what I want to do is start out, woo, after I capture this snake who just took off and just zipped out of the enclosure. Um, okay. There, got them again. I'm going to put them back in for the moment. They are kind of on one today, a little bit uh, skittish, which we're going to address a little bit about uh, brumation skittishness. This is my brumation chamber right here. I've heard of cannibalism in some species of garter snakes, but it's not terribly common. And in many species, it's not common at all. So, I'm sorry to hear that. That's horrible. So you lost him. So, so there's Laura Philippe is here as well. So the species I was just showing was Thamnophis sertalis sertalis, the melanistic form, uh, which is basically a morphin in captive care. There are populations with a high incidence of the uh, dark ones in the wild because they live in places where they need to collect as much solar radiation as possible because they're in very northerly areas where it gets quite cold. So, yep. Um, I see Ramingo is here too. 503 is here. And sorry to hear you're not feeling so well, Ramingo, but hopefully the stream will make it feel better. There's Becca. Welcome, Becca. Um, so, this is my brumation chamber. We're going to start out addressing questions from Samuel Lyons. And we're also going to address some questions from Vance Goodwin about brumation. So um, what I want to do first is um, I'm going to show the uh, process of preparing the brumation chamber, and then we'll directly address the questions. I think preparing the, the chamber itself is going to help but uh, with some of the questions, but then we'll talk about the, we'll address the questions very directly after that. So Gavin Burns, welcome. So you see, I have a, a bin full of leaves. A couple of things I want to point out about this bin. One is it has a hole drilled in it right here. Hopefully you can see that. My finger over here, it goes through a hole. There's a, about approximately an inch hole drilled in the side there. I think you can see it in the shot there. And then um, I have a few ventilation holes drilled along the side. There's one here, one here, just just a few along the edges. 
ventilation hose. You don't want a lot of ventilation in your exterior brumation chamber the way I do it. This is not the only way to do it successfully. This is how I do it. Um, but you want a little ventilation, of course. And then um, the next step, I put a bunch of leaf litter in here. The leaf litter is simply extra insulation just to help keep the, uh, the brumation chamber, the internal um, brumation chamber, uh, insulated a little bit from the cold. The next step is to put in, I put in a sheet of polystyrene with the mylar um, layer on it, shiny stuff. And that is to help reflect heat back into the internal brumation chamber. Okay. Um, next, I put in a heat mat. Now, you don't necessarily have to have one this big. This is just, I have quite a few of these, and this is the one that I decided to use. Um, and then you put the electrical cord for the heat mat, you get it through that hole. That's why I drilled the hole in the side so that I can run the cord through and still securely put the lid on. Okay. And then the next step is to put the thermostat on. And this is a special thermostat. I'm going to show it to you. Kind of thermostat I use. Okay. The particular band I'm using here is an inkbird. But there's something different about this. You notice this says heating and cooling. This is a, a thermostat that does have two, um, two outputs, two electrical sources that you would use for heating and cooling. I'm not going to use this one for heating and cooling, but this particular model, and here's the model. This is an ITC 308 that I'm using uh, by Inkbird. And basically this one has a low range of temperature. Um, I don't want a thermostat that only goes down to 65 or, you know, a lot of the reptile thermostats you use only go down to about 65 degrees. And it might be really hard to see here, but this goes much lower than 60 degrees. So if I want to set this, I can set it quite low. I'm gonna, I don't know if you can see the temperatures, and this is Fahrenheit, so those of you in uh, places where the metric system is used and so on, it's going to be different. But um, Okay, so let's say I want to set it to 43 degrees. I can totally do that. And I'm running through different settings here, but um, I, can, I can make 43 degrees be the temperature I'm going to set it at, and at which point it needs to start heating. Um, generally, I set my thermostat for, oh, it went too long to cycle through all the different numbers here. 43, I usually do it about somewhere between 47 and 55 degrees, what I set it for. Okay, so 47 degrees, I'm going to leave it right there. That's what I did last winter. I had mine at 47 degrees. And then I attach the heat mat to the thermostat. And then I attach the probe to the top of the heat mat and tape it down, usually with you know a pretty resilient sort of tape that's not going to be affected by the warmth. And I'm not doing it right now because this is this is what I'm going to do to set it up, but um, I'm not going to do it right now. I'm going to do that in my garage. Then I set up the brumation chamber. The brumation chamber itself. Looks like this. It's full of leaves too. And this is kind of key. I dampen the leaves somewhat. I don't want them to be a soggy, sodden mess. And these are not wet right now, but I'm going to dampen them somewhat. That helps the uh, snakes to not lose hydration. They don't lose too much water. I found that when I put a water dish in with them while, while they're brumating, they make a mess. They just spill it all over and it does make it kind of a sodden mess. But I learned this from Steve Bowles Garter Snakes. This is the, the method that I've used ever since I started brumating garter snakes several years ago. I just get these leaves kind of moist and I keep them slightly moist uh, the entire time of brumation. Um, so I'll put my snakes in. And this is a, an Irish, we Irish weather type 
um, enclosure, it has a gasket and then it has these locks. So they're not getting out of it. And then you can see it's pretty well ventilated. And then another important step is some additional insulation, which I found is also necessary. So I get like some old towels and stuff. This is my old, uh, my old baby quilt from when I was really little. And I don't feel like this is uh, disrespecting it because it's taking care of my babies all winter. You know, I just put these over the top and then put this on top. I put it out in the garage where there's some extra protection. It's not a heated garage, but it's a pretty cold garage, but it, it's got some protection. You know, when it freezes outside and I have my car in the garage, the garage, the car doesn't get ice on it and stuff. So it gets very cold in there, but it's some protection. And then um, I let it sit out in the garage with a thermostat and check it for, you know, at least 24 hours up to a week just to make sure everything's working, the thermostat's working and everything. And then I'm good to go. And then every week or so I check on them. If I need to moisten the leaves a little bit, I do. I usually put them out right in the beginning of December. And I've I let them brumate anywhere from mid-February to beginning of March. And that's how that works. So I'm going to now adjust the camera and then we'll directly address some of those questions that we were talking about. Uh, sorry, this is going to be a little wobbly for a minute, but uh, I want to look at, you know, the camera as much as I can and be able to talk to you, address you, because you're not going to be looking at uh, the brumation chamber anymore. That would get boring real fast. And hopefully the snakes will join us a little bit and we will go from there. So I'm going to switch this around, uh, switch the camera around, I think, here. And there we go, like that. So I can look at you and I'll be holding a snake uh, or two during the process. So that'll be more fun. And I'll still be able to talk to you and face you a little bit and read the comments. Okay, so I have probably missed many of the uh, many of the comments. So if, if I miss something and you want to talk, uh, you want to talk about, and, and I miss it, then please address it. But please ask me about it. But I'm going to address the questions that were posted on Patreon, Patreon first. Okay. So first, we're going to go to Samuel Lyons' comment or comments. He says, "Hi Russ, can you talk about garter snake rumation on your next stream?" Yes. That was easy. Um, all of mine seem to be slowing down and coming out to explore less and less, although they'll still eat if I dig them out from wherever they're tucked. There they've tucked themselves most of the time. A couple are refusing meals altogether. So that's not uh, abnormal at all this time of year for garter snakes. Um, I it, Mine can do that too. In fact, my, uh, no, I'm sorry, my Montana red-sided garters We'll start doing that in September and sometimes even August. And I thought that at some point I'd actually like to get a refrigerator and start brumating them in September because I think in the localities they're from, they're probably in like montane localities in Montana where it starts freezing in, in September and they probably do need to brumate in the wild starting that early. And why not? It, it's to my benefit to start brumating them at that point if they're ready to, by themselves, if they actually start showing signs of wanting to brumate. I should let them do it for a couple of reasons. One is because they do slow down and they become more skittish and they tend to hide more. So it's not as fun to interact with them at that point. Um, just when they get ready for brumation, that's a thing. And another one is that it makes sense for me to start brumating them early because if I start in November, I were October, September, like maybe late September, you know, I start the cycle, cycling them down in early September, put them into brumation at the end of September, and they brumate through October and November, maybe December. Then I wake them up and they start breeding, and then I get babies earlier when I don't have to worry about the summer being such a difficult time to ship. Because usually, if mine have babies mid May and I keep them for several weeks, to make sure that they're shedding and eating and digesting and all that, those things, then the problem is by that time it's starting to get really hot 
in June, you know, when I'm ready to start shipping them out. So I think being able to ship them out in, say, April or May uh, makes a lot more sense. So uh, that's, that's one thing. Um, I have seen the exact same thing. And if you see that, it's a good sign that you should probably start the brumation cycle if you can. Um, so Corydora brumation is just the, uh, it's basically hibernation for reptiles. Um, the state in which they, you know, they slow down a lot at lower temperatures and uh, they rest during the, the cold season. So, um, Samuel Lines, back to your snakes. It says, a couple are refusing meals altogether. They're still pretty young, but they're all spring babies. So this would be their first winter either way. I've cut everyone's lights back to mimic the natural light. And they're all exposed to natural lighting from exterior walls with windows. But I haven't cut their basking spots or heated areas. Those are always still available. Will they be okay? My red sides from you are still very small, and I worry they don't have enough weight to sleep for as long as they'd like. Should I turn their lights back to 14-hour days? You've got a couple of options, uh, Samuel, but I would say if they're doing that, I always feel like I watch the garters and how they're acting to help me understand if they need to brumate or not. If A lot of times young snakes don't want to brumate, but um, they... And if they don't want to, you know, it's their first year or something, I won't, I won't put them into brumation. But if they're showing signs that they want to brumate, then I would probably let them go ahead and do it. And with snakes, it's not quite the same as it is with, you know, mammals that need to put on a huge amount of fat in order to be able to brumate. Snakes really don't burn much while they're doing it. They're, of course, expending some energy, but they don't need as much as mammals do to get through uh, brumation. And so... A lot of people will actually brumate their snakes when they have a, a, a baby snake that's um, born or hatched um, in the summer and then goes through the fall eating very little or nothing. And they'll say, okay, this snake is really not doing well. They will put it into brumation, which sounds counterintuitive, like, oh, it might starve to death. They'll put it in brum into brumation, and then this spring, when it wakes up, it'll eat ravenously, just be totally fine. So I wouldn't worry about that per se. It, as long as you go through the brumation cycle of preparation to get them ready for brumation, I'd say go ahead even if they're small. And you could also consider a shorter brumation. If you're worried about it, you were saying that they're small, you don't, and you're still worried about it, even um, considering what I just said, you could let them brumate for two weeks, three weeks, a month, and don't, don't go very long. You don't necessarily need to. I've heard people accidentally brumating their snakes when they go on vacation and their, their heat lamp goes out during the winter and the temperature decrease was just enough to make the snakes think they brumated, and they ended up breeding right afterwards. So a short brumation, not necessarily a bad thing. Some people brumate certain garter snakes for only a, a month, and I think that's very possible to do with some species. Other species might be a little bit, uh, you know, might need a little longer, but I do like two, two and a half months, usually for mine. Uh, but, you know, think of that. Hopefully that helps. Um, great questions, and if I didn't address any of them um, as thoroughly as you needed me to, let me know, but I think uh, you were doing the right things with the, the lighting cycle to try to get them closer. But uh, if you've, they have the heating areas, they need those for a certain amount of time to cycle to the point where they're a brewmate. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. So thank you, Samuel, for your questions. Let's move on to Vance's questions, which are related. Vance says, do you incrementally decrease daylight time and temps? And in the spring, do you ease them back up to temp? So with my garter snakes, they do get some decrease in daylight time and temps, mostly just because of ambient changes. Uh, in our house in the summer, about the coolest it ever gets, in the, in the warmth of the, the hot of the, you know the heat of the summer, is about 78 degrees in in that room. It's only about that's about as cool as it gets. So they, maybe at night it'll cool down a little bit, maybe to like 72, 74 or something. But in the daytime it's about 78. And then they have basking spots and so on. So they have warmer areas in their uh, viv area. And then in wintertime, in which you know starts in October, essentially, we're getting temperatures, daytime temperatures maybe around 68 to 70, and nighttime temperatures maybe around 65. And so that's definitely dropping. That's changing their ambient temperatures. They still have basking uh, sites during most of that time, but not all of it. But that helps. Um, there is a big window in that room. And though the window doesn't, you know, there's not direct sunlight. It's a northern window, which is great, because then there's not direct sunlight shining on enclosures. But the fact that that 
light turns off, you know, the natural light decreases when it uh, gets dark outside, um, helps to cycle them too. Uh, so in the spring, I really don't do a whole lot to ease them back up to temp. I might put them in the enclosure and maybe wait a day before I turn the basking lights on. Uh, but other than that, I don't really ease them back a whole lot, and they don't seem to mind that at all. So hopefully that helps. And question number two, how would someone maintain good brumation temps if their house never dips below 70 Fahrenheit with no basement or garage available? You have a couple of options, and it depends on how much space you have and so on. Uh, a lot of people I know just use a refrigerator. They use a refrigerator and have the refrigerator set maybe at 45, 50 degrees Fahrenheit, something like that. And you can use that. Um, you'd need a dedicated refrigerator, most likely not use, you know, the refrigerator used with food. But um, Don's Garter Snakes, he uses a refrigerator. I think um, T uses a refrigerator. A lot of people use that. And that does give you more freedom as to when you can um, use brumation. I use my garage. And the part of the reason I don't start until, you know, beginning of December or in, in very end of uh, November is because just it's not dependably cold enough until then. Because it does get very cold in October sometimes. It'll freeze in October. We'll get, uh, you know, snow sometimes in October and through November we get freezes and snows. But some days it'll be 67 degrees, 70 degrees, whatever. And that's really not cold enough. So to make sure that um, the snakes are not expending too much energy and, uh, you know, basically starving themselves by using too much energy, we uh, wait until that time. So that would be my really best suggestion is get a fridge and do that. A lot of times you can get uh, like the dorm fridges or the small fridges for fairly cheap. I have one that I use to store, uh, you know, animal food and things like that. Uh, and it cost me like $150, which is a lot less than a big fridge, but there's room enough in there to brewmate some snakes. So uh, you could also look into maybe a wine cooler because you can set those temperatures within the range of, of snake brumation for some of them and things like that as well. So number three, typically how long after waking up do you garters get their first meal? Okay, um, typically a week. I wait a week before offering food and I've noticed that whenever I offer food any earlier they really don't take it. So I just wait about a week until I offer food and then they're usually good to eat it. And three A's, does their first post brumation shed have anything to do with that timing? Not really. I've noticed that the shed doesn't seem to be like there's nothing magical about when they shed after they brumate for me any, anyway. Some of them shed right after, you know, within a few days, some wait a few weeks, and I just wait until uh, I wait a week. And then if they, I offer food and they may or may not take it, if they're just starting to shed, I still offer my snakes food when they're about to shed, and sometimes they'll eat it, sometimes they won't. So um, that's basically how I do it. So now I'm going to be paying more attention to the chat. I hope um, Samuel and Vance that those uh, responses were helpful. And I'm going to look at the chat. I'm also going to take a snake or two out and play with them so that you can see some snakes while I'm chatting, because that's always fun, I think. Um, I'm going to put the lid on, though, so the other ones don't get out, because they are, like I said, a little bit more skittish while they're shedding. So maybe I should lower this just a little bit so I don't have to hold the snake up too high. And I can still see the chat, hopefully. Yep. Okay, I see that people are talking about spider beetles. I see Hannah Stewart. I'd like to ask what temperature you suggest to brewmate California red-sided garter snakes. The info I see online seems to be for more northerly species. Thanks very much. I think in many cases, uh, it depends on the locality of the California red sided because throughout different um, portions of California, you'll get different temperature ranges. And so if you have some locality information for your red sided that may help. For example, my wife is a California native, uh, just like the California red sided garter snakes. And she is from an area where it snows in the winter and gets, you know, quite cold. Uh, but of course, there are places in California where snow is pretty rare and where the the temperatures throughout the winter are on average much higher than where my wife lives. So um, I would say if you have locality information, that could be helpful because there may be places where you could do the same temperature range that I do for mine and set your um, heater at 47 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, there are other snakes that uh, garter snakes 
uh, California garter snakes that are on the coast and so on, where the daytime temperatures in the middle of the winter might be in the 60s and 70s, and you might not want to go quite that low. I would say um, you're probably safe at around 60 to 65 degrees, though, in general. That's, that's really not too cold, but it's, it's cold enough. And I would probably not uh, let the Cali Reds roommate too long. I think uh, it, I would maybe do a month if I were going to do um, with the Cali Reds. I, I don't work with Cali Reds. That's my disclaimer. But just based on that, that would be my gut feeling that I would do um, based on what I know about them, which is admittedly limited. Okay. So this is Carlos right here, it looks like. Carlos, my one of my melanistic male garters. Nice to see you here, Kevin. Oh, Tarantula Collective with a super chat. Nice. And thank you. Really glad you love the content. And uh, I'll try to keep doing what I do. I love your content too, as you know. Um, so yeah, thanks you so much, Richard, for the super chat. That's awesome. And I just shipped out the winner of the Harmony House uh, um, gift that uh, we did. Um, Dylan was the name of the, the winner, the one who win, won the Aquarimax $75 uh, gift card for that. And I uh, just shipped it out the other day. So that was really fun. Thank you for inviting me to participate in that great cause. And let's see. I love, I love their white chins, yeah. And, and part of the cool thing is that the white chin helps you identify them because they all have slightly different scalation. See how Carlos has one white dot? I don't know if you saw that. One white dot on the side there. You can kind of see that. Um, and his uh, counterpart, the other male that I have, um, Cecil, has a longer line of white dots. And so I know that he's Cecil. And Grenda... Um, doesn't have any supralabial scales um, that are white, but all, she has sublabial scales that are white. And so I know she's Grinda, and Mabel has some uh, supralabial scales so that um, I know I can tell them apart. So that's kind of cool. I noticed, Richard, that you got some spider beetles. They're so interesting looking. And the, the macro shots you did were fantastic. So, so name, where can I buy live specimens of giant scavenger beetles online this time of year? I would definitely check with bugs in cyberspace. I think he still has some. Available. Let's see. Therapod Hunter, have you ever kept Chromus vitatus? I have not. Oh, Kevin. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, that's right. Because you have you have uh, this species natively in your state, so you couldn't breed melanistics and then and then uh, sell them. That's right. But I guess you could keep them. You just couldn't sell the breed them and sell the babies. Yeah, we're fortunate that that doesn't. That's not a problem. We don't have easterns in this state. We have we have the valley garters. The Thamnophis fitchi. We have the uh, wandering garters, which are by far and away the more common species, uh, which is um, Thamnophis uh, elegans vagans. And then we have a couple others. We have a black neck. We have a limited range of a black necked um, garter, and debatably, possibly one or two others that are in limited ranges. But uh, as far as commonly seen in the state, it's only those two. So Therapod Hunter, that's your latest millipede. It's probably a close all over. It's probably a pet Arthropleura. How would that be? I, I think having a pet Arthropleura would be kind of scary because it's like bigger than you. So in Michigan, you can only keep up to six Easterns. You have to maintain a valid fishing license to do so. Interesting. I did not know that. I believe to collect reptiles in this state for to keep not just to pick up and look at 
I believe we have to have a valid fishing license too. And you have to go through like a, you have to go through like a, take a questionnaire sort of thing about reptiles. Look at this pile of snakes. I think the, uh, the lighting's a little bit different from here than it was before. And you can see their bellies better. Those ventral scales are amazing. Those ventral scoots. So shiny. <coughs> Sorry about that. Tried to not cough into the microphone here. Hopefully that was successful. <laughs> Item 13. Hello. Welcome. Anybody else have any brumation questions? I feel like I was able to basically give the rundown on how I do it. And once again, I should I should stress, that's not the only way to do brumation. That's how I do it. I basically learned it from uh, Steve Bowles Garter's website, and I've done it that way ever since I started. Yeah, look at that pile of snicks. Oh, I just saw Carlos. There's Grinda. There's Mabel. Thank you, Aunt Sandys, for joining in. Glad you could make it to the first part of the stream. So, Kevin, how do you deal with the anxiety of brumating for the first time? I did feel some anxiety, admittedly. Um, I think what really helped was making sure that I had the brumation set up outside in the garage, functioning so I could monitor it for several days. I think it was about a week, if I remember correctly. Just monitoring the temperature ranges and everything for a, you know that period of time, approximately a week before I put the snakes out there. I think that really helped because I, okay, the heater's actually working. I take my temp gun out there and test all different parts of the enclosure and say, okay, if I use the temp gun and I'm aiming at the interior of the enclosure at the base, this is the temperature here and this is the temperature up at the top of the leaves and it's still within suitable parameters. I feel good. Um, that really, really helped. And then I did check on them a bit more often my first year like maybe every two days or so, instead of every week or so. It's really, you don't want to disturb them too much, but I felt like I had to do it a little bit more. Um, so there you go. Oh, Mr. and Mrs. Morelia sent a super chat as well. Fantastic. I'm trying to, to love it there. Okay. Um, for the garters, especially the melanistics, and you need some Cali red side in your collection. I do. There's so many garters I need. I would love to have... Uh, Cali Reds. I would love to have Oregon Red Spotteds too, which look a lot like the Cali Reds. They're a little more calm in general. But thank you so much for the super chat and all the support for the little snakes. Much appreciated. Got su two super chats today. One from Richard and one of the Tarantula Collective and one from Mr. and Mrs. Malia. That's awesome. So, yeah. So basically I wanted to say if you have any other questions about rumation, please let me know. But that is the essential rundown. So Corydora, full-grown snakes. It is possible that the males, there are two males and two females here. It's a little hard to tell when they're all just in a tangle, but the females are a little bigger. Uh, the males will grow a little bit more. Probably not a lot more, but they will grow a little bit more because snakes don't really stop growing ever, but they essentially, you know, they do slow down for sure. They don't ever really stop. So the males will grow a bit more. The females have the potential to grow quite a bit more. They could get a lot bigger. If you've ever seen my uh, snake, Ruby, she's a, a, a Montana red-sided garter, so not the same species as the Cali red. It's, well, it's the same species. It's just not the same subspecies. Uh, they are, she is a lot bigger than this. I'm half tempted to see if someone will bring her down so you can see the difference. They have the potential to get that big, the, the females. To get about as big as she is. I mean, she's big for a garter. Most species of garter, there are some species of garter that get bigger, like the um, some of the Mexican garters, like uh, the the um, Thamnophis um, equus, Thamnophis the uh, the Lake Chapala is the, the Thamnophis equus. At least one of the equus is Lake Chapala. There are quite a few other garters uh, down there that get pretty big, like five feet long or so. And the uh, the giant garter that lives in California gets, you know, they could be six feet long. But as far as most garters, she's big. She's nearly four feet long. 
So uh, these definitely not done yet. The males might be close to done. The females are probably going to put on a good deal of size. There's Carlos right there with all those markings on his neck. You can see he's the one with the most markings on his neck. It does kind of look like I'm holding up Medusa's head, doesn't it? This one has a few markings right along the back. Oh, there's one thing I forgot. Uh, a couple things I forgot about brumation that are important that I didn't get to. Okay, one is pre-brumation preparation. I was going to talk about that, and I didn't get there, so I need to do that. I'm sorry. Okay, so pre-brumation preparation. About a month before you put the snakes into brumation, you need to do stop feeding. It's very important that you stop feeding them because you need them to um, empty their digestive tracts out. You do not want to put a snake into brumation that has food in its digestive tract at any point in the digestive tract because the cooler temperatures would prevent the snake from further digesting the food, and the food would slowly but surely rot in the snake and could very likely kill them and certainly wouldn't do them any good uh, and is very, very likely to be life-threatening. So you need about a month to let them clear out their um, digestive systems. And then what I do is right around Halloween, since I'm planning on putting them into uh, brumation right at the end of November, beginning of December, um, right in, around Halloween, they're feeding closest to Halloween is my last feeding that I give them. And I let them go for three weeks-ish at normal temps to make sure that they you know, purge all that food. Uh, and then you can give them an optional bath at that point, which I did. Gave all my garters a bath uh, at that point, which can, um, in the water, about 80 degree water, uh, Fahrenheit, of course, to give them a chance to move around a little bit, hydrate a little bit more if they need to, and also defecate if they need to. If there's anything left in their system, a lot of times a bath with all that swimming around in the uh, warm water will um, cause them to defecate and get rid of whatever remnants there were in their digestive system because you definitely need to get that out. Then I will, and you want to dry them off so that they don't get chilled. And uh, then you put them back in their enclosure with normal basking lights and everything for a day or so. And then you turn it off. You turn off the basking lights. You, you turn off, remove their heat source. So they're just at room temps. And you can keep them at room temps for a day, two, three days, a week, something like that, just depending on how it works with your schedule before you put them into brumation. And that helps um, kind of wind down a little bit. So these guys, um, I gave them a bath on... I don't remember when that was. I think it was Friday. Gave them a bath on Friday. I let their, uh, kept their basking lights on for a day or two after that and then turned their basking lights off. So. Oh, and Marcianus, uh, over 500 grams. Yeah, that's a pretty good, good sized garter snake. And that's nice that she's gravid. You got a Marcianus that's gravid. That's fantastic. Ashley, Ashley, welcome. Yeah, so I guess it could be considered a type of food poisoning in that uh, food poisoning is often caused by bacterial growth on the food. This one, in this case, it would just happen after they ate it if you kept them at uh, too cool a temperature after eating so they couldn't digest. So it is very dangerous either way. Um, but yeah, definitely don't feed your garters for at least, I would say, three to four weeks before you put them into brumation. Let them make sure they get rid of all that food in their systems first. And just to refer back to something I kind of alluded to but didn't maybe state directly, garters will often get a little bit um, skittish, a little bit less likely to come out and explore uh, right near the time they start getting to uh, rumation. I, I, that's the first sign that I notice, that it's getting time to start the, the cycle, is that they... They don't want to um, come out, and they tend to be a little more skittish. And then they often will get to the point where they'll start refusing food. Some will, some won't. Some will eat right up to the time when you know I stop feeding them, but others will start refusing food. And so usually in August even, 
I will go from feeding my garters twice a week, my adult garters twice a week, to feeding them once a week in August, and do that through September and October, because they just don't want to eat as much. They're usually, you know, once they wake up from brumation, about a week after they wake up from brumation, they really want to eat, and it depends. The females usually want to eat more than the males. The males are in sort of mating mode and may not eat for a few weeks after brumation. I should have mentioned that earlier too. Everything's kind of occurring to me piecemeal. But um, I offer them food after about a week. They will often take it, but the males will be sporadic about how they will eat. Females are usually ravenous uh, from waking up until, you know, August. And, of course, during all the... the um, pregnancy or their state of being gravid, uh, they will they will eat ravenously during that whole time. But the males, eh, especially while they're thinking about mating, they just don't want to eat as much. And they might eat, you know, once a week where the female's eating two to three times a week uh, and just take one pinky or something and she'll pound two adult mice and a couple of quail and a few earthworms, you know, in one sitting She'll, she's a big snake, and she'll take quite a lot. They are they are very shiny, aren't they? Kind of matte on the top and shiny on the bottom, which I love. It's a, it's a really nice effect. I think melanistic garter snakes are super underrated. People are all about the uh, the Mexican black king snakes. I have nothing against those. I think they're gorgeous. If I could keep one, I would. And there's lots of other gorgeous black snakes. Not saying anything about that, but people forget about the garters. And I think it may be partly because you get spots like this that Cecil has. I think they just add to the charm that they have a few little spots like that. Most of them don't have, most of mine don't have as many spots as Cecil does, but I think they're beautiful with the spots, without the spots. Ooh, sorry, buddy. They're just gorgeous. That's just how they are. Another thing I should say is that you saw the brumation chamber. It's small, really small. But you don't have to offer the same space to a brumating snake as you would to an active snake. The snakes are fairly active during their brumation. They definitely move throughout the brumation style. They're not just going to sit in one spot, hunker down, and stay coiled up or anything. But they don't move nearly as much as they do when they're uh, at full temperatures. And in the wild, they're in crevices down deep in the you know, underground, under logs and things like that, where there's logs that are partially buried in the ground and there are crevices underneath them or rocks or limestone caves or different things like that. A lot of times they're not going to have a lot of space. So Ashley, I'm actually holding four. <laughs> it's kind of hard to tell, isn't it? So um, I, I can't blame you for guessing, but there are four of them here. I think you could see just all four of them just there for a second. So Whitby Jet, there, Pot Hunter, is that a, a mineral? That would be pretty cool if you could carve a garter snake head out of it. Yeah, but it's funny when they're all together, it's, you can't really tell that some of them are bigger than others or anything like that, even though that's, that is indeed the case. Oh, that's not what I meant to do. Um, live chat. Sorry, I accidentally switched to super chat only, which I didn't want to do. I always appreciate the super chats, but I don't want to limit it to just super chats. So, Kevin, you're saying you're, the melanistic you have would, would hold that still, but finding others that do the same. <laughs> yeah, these... Fortunately, these are very tame. I've worked with them quite a bit over the past year and a half that I've had them. They, they're very, very tame. So I love that. So Ashley is saying that people find garters here in winter right along their patio doors. And they come into the rehab to stay for the winter. Interesting. That's interesting that they end up in a spot like that. So what time of the year? Like any time of the year during the winter? 
are they they crawling out of some space that they were roomating in along the edge of the house or something we have a crack in our patio in the backyard and there is a red not a red there is a wandering garter that will uh, come out of that crack i think he roommates under the house somewhere I, I didn't see him last year but i've seen him two or three years before and he was often associated with that area well every time i saw him he was in the area around that crack Okay, so it's a fossilized monkey puzzle tree. Is that what it is there, Pod Hunter? How many of you saw my uh, How many of you saw my son's paleontology video that I posted to my community page? He used this background to film it. I thought it was kind of fun, and I posted it to the community page. Uh, he's got a channel with something like twenty thousand subscribers, and he's doing pretty well. So it's fun to see that he is following in my footsteps and that he has a youtube channel too also related to the natural world it's just this is focused very much on paleontology which is awesome okay they snuggle in along the house then people start cleaning up for christmas decorations it seems when they find them ah that makes sense off tech hello has been a while since we've seen you in the stream glad to see you here wow Therapod Hunter, I'd love to see a picture of that, of this uh, Whitby jet that you said. Um, fossilized monkey puzzle tree. That sounds interesting. So young lad, you haven't uh, watched it yet, but you subscribed. Well, that's cool. That's cool. Now he has another subscriber. It was kind of fun for me to see him filming the video in front of this background and just kind of thinking like father like son it was fun <laughs> item 13 i wonder if clint would be down for a crossover with your son he loves dinosaurs you know that would be really cool i would love that so sean meister if you go to my community tab on youtube um the last post i did on my community tab is a link directly to my son's video or if you look up the Vividen, uh, the Vividen, V I V I D E N, Paleontology Evolved. And probably if you just typed Paleontology Evolved, um, then you would uh, you'd get there too. But that's his website. Um, sorry, his YouTube channel is called The Vividen Paleontology in Evolved. So trying to count how many you have in your hands. What's your guess, Aftech? Ashley asked, and I just told her a minute ago, but I want to see if you can guess how many I have. If I hold it closer, does that help? Three at least is true. There are at least three. All right, thanks, 503, for joining in, as always, and I uh, hope the kid has fun at band. A couple of our kids did band. Two of them, to be exact. One of them played the tuba, and one of them played the clarinet. Oh, looks like I only have about 10 minutes left. Did I cover everything I needed to cover about, uh, about brumation? Yeah, there are four Aftec. Um, it can be hard to see them all at once. They they moved perfectly so that uh, Ashley could see all four of them at one point, <laughs> but it's, they're making it a little harder. And I do love that garters are so sociable that in the wild they actually seek out companionship of their own kind and have recognizable friends, essentially. They, they have individuals, they have preferences uh, to seek out certain individuals preferentially, which is fantastic. Personally, I think it may help them uh, connect with humans a little better, just the fact that they are communal and that they have preferences. Um, my wife says that when I, when somebody else holds the snakes and we try to do sno snake socialization circles or snorkels or snake circles, uh, you know, fairly frequently where everybody has a snake and holds it for a while and then passes it on and we switch, switch snakes and everybody does that, that when we do that, the snakes often seem to gravitate towards me. 
like they recognize me uh, more than they recognize other people because I'm the one who works with them the most, which is interesting. So yes, please everyone hit the like button. That would be fantastic. We've got 23 people in the stream and 22 likes that I can see on my screen. Sometimes I've noticed they don't get updated very quickly or accurately, but there you go. So basically soon I need to put, in the next day or two, I'm going to be putting the um, brumation chamber outside into the garage, not outside, but put them in the garage so that I can start monitoring the temperature for at least 24 hours uh, before I put the snakes in. So I'm going to need to put them in really soon. I want to make sure that they're in there by the very beginning of December at the latest. So I want them to get a good solid two months. So Mr. and Mrs. Merrily, I don't know that I can make it to the 12 Supreme Days of Christmas today. Hopefully I can pop in at some point. Um, but I don't know if my donation to the Supreme Days of Christmas has been given away yet. Um, but Frank the Tank, welcome and enjoy the 12 Supreme Days of Christmas. I hope everybody checks it out. Um, if you haven't ever attended the 12 Supreme Days of Christmas, go to the Supreme Gecko channel uh, right after this and check it out. It'd be cool. And Becca, I'm glad you love them. I do too. So Becca Nichols, will the Whirligig beetles eat the algae wafers too? Um, in my experience, the whirligig beetles will nibble slightly at floating fish food. They usually drop it after a second, and they really, really prefer soft-bodied insects. I found the fruit flies, uh, both the the Hydei fruit flies, which are bigger than the Melanogaster fruit flies, and the uh, Pyralis farinellus moths are their favorite foods that I have offered them. They also will take very small crickets. They don't really seem to like big crickets much. They'll, they'll grab it, and then they'll tend to drop it, and then the other beetles will go after the crickets more than they will if the crickets are large. If they're very small crickets, they'll totally go after those. But the fruit flies are like the staple thing that I offer them. And then I offer them those other two foods, pyralis moths and um, very small crickets. Seems to be the way it is. They just they prefer soft-bodied live insects they seem to be attracted by the movement to a large extent that they, they will take fish food flakes though better than they will take any other like pellets or crisps they tend to drop um they'll drop those after a second but the flakes they'll actually eat i had forgotten that it is true ashley the top is definitely more matte and the, the ventral surface is a lot more glossy that is that is true not just a camera trick or a trick of the light. Yeah, and that's true that on the top they have, the, the scales are much more rough than they are on the belly. Um, and Becca, you can definitely order fruit flies online. You can buy them at most pet stores these days too. Even the big box stores will carry fruit fly cultures. I have been culturing my own fruit flies for years and years, and that's what I do. I just... I have fruit fly cultures for my dart frogs, for my morning geckos, for my whirligig beetles, for lots of creatures, my young spiders, you know, that kind of stuff. So fruit flies, if you're going to have whirligig beetles, whether they're the giant whirligig beetles or the small whirligig beetles, either way, fruit flies are good. The uh, small whirligig beetles would probably be fine. I'm sure they'd be fine with the, the Heidi eye fruit flies, but they would also be fine with the melanogaster. And for that matter, the... Uh, Giant whirligigs will eat the melanogaster. I just feel like the uh, Hydei are more of a, an appropriate food item because they just kind of like the difference between eating popcorn and eating a uh, drumstick, I guess. Oh, Luke, yeah. Sounds like it's probably good to get a little bit of a cooler temperature going for your Japanese rat snake. Um, so Becca, it seems like they, they appreciate the live ones. They'd probably eat the dead ones too. I don't think it has to be alive for the whirligigs to eat them. They do seem attracted to the live ones. Can you put a collar on a garter snake and let it hunt squirrels in my yard? 
Well, I don't think they've developed a collar that works for garter snakes yet. And I don't think they have squirrels that are small enough for garter snakes either. But it's a funny uh, image for sure. I think Gamera would be a good name for a Sokata tortoise. They, they're practically kaiju already, Sokata tortoises, by the time they grow up. So that works. Well, it is just about time for me to wrap up. I want to make sure I give everybody time for the 12 supreme days of Christmas. Thank you, everyone, for joining in. Thanks for the super chats. Thanks for the Patreon questions. And uh, if there's any final questions I can manage in the last minute or so, I would love to do that. But otherwise, we will uh, see you soon. Interesting, Luke. Your giant African pixie frog brewmates every year from November until spring, and you don't even have to lower the temperatures. As long as it works for him, that's awesome. Snake hats and sweaters. I have seen the sweaters and the hats, which is awesome. Never seen a collar, but the hats and the sweaters. My, my daughter is actually thinking about making some, which would be funny, I think. All right. Well, that's about it for this stream. Thanks again. And... Uh, be sure to check out my next video. I'm going to give you a hint. This one's an isopod species profile with a guest and on Friday, my next video, an isopod species profile of a species I've never kept and uh, features a guest. So make sure to check it out. Catch you later. Uh, have a good one, everybody.